to it in a few words. So my name is Reinhard Schader. I studied uh, biology actually in uh, Heidelberg in Germany. Um, then I went to the EMBL in Heidelberg, spent there uh, eight years, I think. Then we founded a company. Uh, I went to the US for two years in, in Boston to have the US operations. And then I came back uh, to Germany, also working for the company. And then in 2003 or four, I think I went back to the EMBL to become a group leader there. And since uh, 2011, I'm now in Luxembourg at the Luxembourg Center for Systems Biomedicine, which is part of the university in Luxembourg. It's a very young university and our institute is also very young, was founded in 2009. Our director, Rudi Balling, uh, founded it, and he's actually now leaving this month uh, because he reached uh, his retirement age. Uh, we are about 260 people right now in 16 uh, research groups, and I'm heading the bioinformatics core facility there. We have about 50 people now in the, in the core facility uh, working on you know, platforms, helping people in the lab from... Uh, data management plans and so on, but we also do research and uh, try to, to reach out in all kinds of things. We have a, a bunch of European projects uh, and so-called innovative medicine projects. These are large consortia in, in Europe. Um, and there we are very um, heavily involved, I have to say. And then one piece is also the visualization of, of data. And uh, this group, Marek is leading in principle, and we started there, who uh, age school, I think Marek, how many years? Six, seven years uh, at least, uh, where we <coughs> try to um, yeah, get all the information which is available for Parkinson's disease in a visual map and trying to explore the knowledge in, in that map. And uh, I mentioned already that the, the platform is, is called Minerva and it's open. Uh, source. So we have uh, the, the data for people on our machines. Uh, and this was very successful uh, in Parkinson. We also have a network now, a disease network, where uh, I forgot how many, how many people are in there, but we have uh, biannual meetings uh, where we come together um, with, with all the different expertise from different areas. And when COVID uh, struck us, uh, Mark, uh, I think he was brave and didn't really know what he was doing. He uh, thought that to have a COVID map would also be a good idea. And he asked people to join the efforts. And this was an incredible successful um, endeavor. I think we have more than 170 people working on this thing with uh, a lot of uh, institutions worldwide. Um, this effort is still going on and we just got the, the paper accepted in, um, what is it, systems, molecular systems by MSB, yes. Um, where we got the first uh, results out of all this uh, collaboration. And I think Marek will explain a little bit what what is in there now and what this map is doing and how we are using it. So I would give the word to Marek and he is the expert on the maps. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Reinhard. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I will be sharing my screen now. Okay, just give me a second. I just need to share this desktop. Share, okay. And I hope you will be able to see my slides now. Okay. Um, sure. Okay. Great. So, um, once again, thanks a lot, uh, Reinhard, for, for kind words. Uh, I'm going to be talking today a little bit about the COVID-19 disease map and uh, how, how we came about with uh, building that type of repository uh, for uh, molecular mechanisms of, of COVID-19. And uh, I'm speaking here on behalf of the COVID-19 disease map community. Uh, I really would like to stress at the very beginning that this is a, an effort involving a large group of people who devoted a lot of their time and um, 
I would just like to give a lot of credits to the people. Um, we use uh, Fedom Hub uh, as um, basically the the platform to uh, to give credit to uh, to show what people are doing, but in particular in all uh, in this project. So you are very welcome to to visit the Fedom Hub. Uh, the project is um, the project number is here, uh, but uh, I will also uh, share this link later. So. Um, Moving on uh, a little bit about the disease maps themselves. Reinhardt was mentioning uh, this uh, earlier. We were starting at LCSB as a um, systems biomedicine institute. So um, there was a, a, a um, very uh, large focus put on the systems of computational approach to analyzing mechanisms of the diseases. And we realized, starting with Parkinson's disease, which was the initial focus of the of the uh, of the center, uh, that uh, we need to gather what we know, and we also need to gather it in a um, computationally acceptable and uh, way, such that also uh, experts, so basically life scientists, clinical researchers, could take a look at it and examine it, and. Uh, the disease maps as a paradigm, these are basically models, conceptual models of diseases, uh, which are primarily focused on knowledge driven. Um, so what, what we know about the mechanism of the disease driven data interpretation and modeling. So uh, the disease maps encode molecular uh, mechanisms of diseases following computational standards. Uh, they offer intuitive exploration and comprehensive overview of disease mechanisms, uh, allow visualization of complex omics data sets, and allow reproducible exploration and analysis. I hope uh, I will be able to, uh, to show this a little bit later. And you're all welcome to, uh, to go to diseasemaps.org. This is where we uh, keep information a little bit more uh, generic about the disease maps and uh, a small uh, advert we are going to have um, our annual um, conference. Uh, it's going to be a virtual event at the end of November. Uh, there is still two weeks for abstract submission. Please go to the diseasemaps.org. Uh, you are going to, you should be able to have an, an easy access to, uh, to the events and how it's going to be organized. And uh, perhaps you might be interested in joining there. But uh, moving on to the COVID-19 disease map. So um, when, the whole pandemics started. Um, we have reached out through our networks um, of, of people who, um, not only at LCSB, but there are a, a large group of, of, of people who are encoding these disease mechanisms um, in pathways and uh, in maps. We reached out to see if there would be any interest in, in a project where we would like to go for existing literature about COVID-19 and similar viruses, go and apply the approach of disease maps. So start with a curation and review, uh, integrate this into computational formats like SBML, SBGN, with the help of text mining uh, for exploration modeling of these mechanisms to get new scientific insights. So um, we came up with this and uh, actually the response of the community was, uh, was uh, tremendous. Um, so far at this moment, I think the project counts closer to 250 members, uh, over uh, 120 institutions, 30 countries. So this is based on the Fedom Hub uh, in information. And uh, these people range, uh, the, the expertise uh, of these people range from clinical researchers to life scientists, but also more computationally versed people. So uh, we have um, a community which has a very interdisciplinary um, background and uh, also comes from different uh, environments. Um, you're welcome to visit our page, COVID pages that you need at LU. I'll move to that page a little bit later and our Fairdom uh, Hub profile. The thing is that um, when we were starting, it was uh, really, um, uh, as um, Reinhardt was also men mentioning, this was a, a really um, on the fly process of organizing things and putting 
things together. And uh, we used a lot of uh, Google platform uh, technology, you could say. So uh, our guidelines for curation were uh, put in the Google Docs first because it allows uh, allowed us to, um, uh, to, to have a, a little bit of flexibility about this. Uh, we shared slides of our uh, regular theses and, uh, um, and basically organized information about contributors and, and the curation targets initially uh, in Google Sheets. What was important, uh, and uh, I really would like to stress it here, is that we immediately started to have weekly telephone conferences with uh, the community, exchanging information about what we are curating, how we are doing this, um, what are the quality that we require, what are the interesting publications, but not only about that, but immediately there were people who could pick up these uh, results of this work and uh, applied immediately their analytical pipelines, their shared, their, their, um, 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 their experiences with the knowledge that has been, that was being built. And this was a very, very quick feedback loop where people spoke to each other and they are still speaking to each other um, very, uh, very intensively. And this allowed us to progress very, very quickly. So if I could uh, highlight three areas of focus of the COVID-19 disease map project, it was uh, curation and content sharing, basically to make sure that uh, the knowledge that we are building, the diagrams that we are building for the map are uh, of good quality and uh, the knowledge is represented in a way that can be interpreted. And we also needed to coordinate parallel efforts. I was working previously on different disease maps projects but uh, this was my first time when uh, we were having a situation where we had, I think, 20 different curation efforts in parallel. And these people needed to talk, exchange. And uh, this was um, one area that, that we, we decided to focus. Another one is integration and interoperability. Uh, I think Miguel mentioned this before, that it's very different, difficult to put different pathways together. Uh, they are often put on different resources, as we will see in a moment. So um, combining this content, so providing tools for format interchange, that was a challenge. Uh, what we also wanted to do is um, to uh, support curators by having um, text mining and interaction databases by informatic interaction databases as additional source of knowledge, such that uh, we could quickly point out or fish out interesting new targets or new pathways which can be uh, curated and of course grant easy access to whatever is being built and the, the last area of focus was analysis and modeling so uh, immediately as i mentioned before people started to use this curated content to predict and generate new hypotheses and this gave immediate feedback to the curators saying listen the diagram that you just created has some flaws because when I translate it into my pipeline, it has errors, uh, it does not compute. Uh, so basically uh, we had this a very short feedback loop. So uh, all of this created a very complex ecosystem of different tools and sources. And uh, uh, let me guide you through this uh, complex picture. Uh, so uh, as I was mentioning, uh, I hope you see my cursor. Um, as I was mentioning, one of the areas was curation. So basically create, creating um, content using different tools and combining them together into, um, into a, a format that is interchangeable or at least interchanging between the formats. Um, interoperability with uh, text mining and interaction databases. And then last but not least, the analysis. So using this curated content enriched by external databases to the downstream analytical pipelines. And basically these are the three um, groups that I was mentioning, mostly curators, domain experts, analysts and modelers, which were basically talking to each other. Uh, curators provided the diagrams, which then were visualized for domain experts. Uh, the integrated and enriched content was made available for anal analysts and modelers in different formats, such that they could work with all these pipelines and provide feedback both to the curators and to the domain experts for interpretation of hypothesis and for improvement of the diagrams. So um, from uh, that point of view, like I said, and um, the information about the activity of all the groups is, is being stored at Fairdom Hub. So um, 
there is a lot of going on in 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 this picture but um the the main idea is that we wanted to have uh, a lot of processes harmonized and streamlined in order for people to be able to access all sorts of information for uh, overall improvement of the quality of the map and putting it to use so let's go through these areas uh, a little bit more in detail um, step by step so uh, curation and content sharing so we wanted to have a, a simultaneous development of system biology diagrams. So in this case, as I was mentioning, we had a group of, of curators and uh, I really would like to stress that uh, we had a number of contributors uh, of the diagrams, but what was important was that these were not, uh, mm, these were also um, people from major pathway database efforts. So we immediately got uh, in our project, people from Wiki Pathways, from React Home, and a lot of independent um, diagram um, designers who basically were building their um, their diagrams uh, using tools like Cell Designer, New Editor, and so on. So Wiki Pathways and React Home stored their content directly in their um, uh, in their uh, respective databases because both Wiki Pathways and React Home have their own web interfaces to, to store and show um, their interaction diagrams. But the diagrams which were created independently in Cell Designer and so on. So this is where our expertise was uh, quite important because we integrated all of these diagrams in a, a GitLab, so in a publicly available shared repository. And we used our Minerva platform to actually combine them into something that was able to be visualized. And as Wiki Pathways and React Home already have the visualization interfaces, and with the help of Minerva, we were able to show um, these diagrams to, um, to the broader audience, you could say. And uh, so far as a curation and content sharing, you could say, um, just a second. Yes, so for the curation and content sharing, um, we can currently have uh, 22 diagrams submitted to date independently. So on our GitLab, uh, we store the content of these diagrams. Um, basically, you can, um, perhaps I can just put it in a little bit more interactive mode. Let me just escape here. And if I'm going to take this link, so our GitLab account uh, looks as follows. So basically you have the curation efforts uh, of the independent curators available here. Uh, all is version controlled. And uh, what we try to do is for instance, for the apoptosis, you have the readme, which has a, a small description of the diagram and uh, has the creators of the diagram and potential contributors uh, mentioned in here. So this is how we try to uh, try to store this information. And you have some versions which were uh, provided by um, by authors along the way. So uh, this repository contains not only uh, the diagrams, but also some um, workflows and, and analytical scripts. But from that point of view, um, the um, uh, what I wanted to stress is that the independent diagrams are openly accessible similarly to actually what happens with the, um, with uh, Wiki Pathways and React Home, they also have that. I will get back to this in a, in a little while, but um, let's get back to the presentation. So we have 22 diagrams submitted to date um, on the GitLab. In the Wiki Pathways collection, I believe there are 19 diagrams available and React Home SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2. Um, there are two big maps available there in their collection for view. And uh, actually, if we take a, a bird's eye view on this, um, even though these diagrams are, um, you could say a set of independent uh, or um, separate to a certain extent um, diagrams of different aspects and different mechanisms. So this is the these are the diagrams in Wiki Pathways. These are the diagrams of platform independent diagrams. And this is how a reactome looks like. Uh, still they are interconnected and we are working on cross-format translation or move to that. So when we have uh, a diagram, so this is uh, one of the diagrams in uh, built in one of the tools that we are using often, uh, Cell Designer. 
So this is the, the diagram um, built for apoptosis pathway. And uh, the thing is that uh, you see it in, in cell designer, but because of our um, translational tools, we also can translate it from cell designer to original to uh, SBML with layout and render to PathVisio, which is uh, which is basically a tool for GPML handling for wiki pathways and to SBGNML. So uh, we have some uh, we have um, some decent possibility of translating these diagrams. And as you see, this is done automatically. As you see, to a large extent, the layout and the content of the diagram is being preserved in between formats. Of course, there are some caveats. So if we'll take a look at only one of these, uh, we have one interaction, which is an, an unknown inhibition. So the curator didn't have a complete confidence that the complex of BCL-MCL1 and BCL2L1 is inhibiting uh, the activation of bad BBC and BCL2L11. So this was uh, in cell design or represented like that. Uh, as a matter of fact, SBGNML does not have that type of interaction. So this was not translated at all. In PathVisio, this has been translated correctly, but you see the basically the, uh, the state transition sign has uh, basically been missed and uh, we do not have information about the activity. And uh, as well in Copasi uh, with layout and render, we also lose some of the information about activity and so on. So uh, the format uh, can be translated, but they are not entirely perfect. So, to summarize, um, we want to, uh, so in the COVID-19 disease map, we are using different tools and different platforms to store the diagrams. And this way we are trying to achieve the goal of having simultaneous parallel development of systems biology diagrams describing SARS-CoV-2. And uh, so far in the project, we really can harmonize diagrams from independent curators, reactome and wiki pathways. And uh, for that process, really uh, standards and guidelines are key to let the curators know how these diagrams can be built and uh, should be built, what information should be annotated and uh, how it can be, uh, uh, how it's going to be used downstream. What's important is uh, we applied a very simple and underestimated tool, which was a review checklist which basically was a set of very simple based, uh, very simple guidelines. I think an hour, uh, a, a page or a page and a half long, which then uh, it was an, uh, an effort, but diagram by, per, per diagram, we had a, a review TC with, with all the curators and we were going through the checklist. Are all elements represented like that? Are all reactions represented like that? Have all uh, COVID-19 uh, proteins, SARS-CoV-2 proteins, are they annotated properly? Are they represented properly? And so on and so forth. And uh, this uh, was a very, um, uh, very simple and a very powerful approach to actually harmonize across these groups. So still, uh, we still face some challenges. We have a lot of tool and format specificities, um, just a small, uh, just a small thing. Still, there is no good representation for complexes across all these tools. And uh, in diagram editors, it's very difficult and cumbersome to introduce literature evidence. And we required this from the curators in order to have these diagrams properly uh, with proper provenance. And uh, last but not least, um, because we have different pathways which describe different granularities of uh, cellular and molecular biology, they are quite often difficult to combine. So metabolic pathways, very difficult to combine with signaling pathways uh, and with gene regulator pathways and so on and so forth. So there are still some challenges on how to meaningfully bring this content together, which leads me to the next challenge of the project, which was integration and interoperability. So uh, as I was mentioning before, we have a, an interchange between different systems biology layouts, uh, a format, um, the networks are available in the, the diagrams are available in network format. So uh, simple interaction format, cytoscape, RDF, and also in formats allowing modeling. So SBML, SBML12. So uh, we, as, as I was mentioning, um, we were integrating this with uh, interaction uh, databases and text mining. 
to suggest new interactions for curators, complete network models, uh, and this way speeding up the entire process of building the map. And we wanted to have easy access to the curated content. So uh, going after web-based visualization, API access of diagrams and conversion scripts. So this is more or less how it looks like. Uh, so adding to the curation effort, as I was mentioning before, we have added this enrichment part on the, on the text mining and interaction databases. And uh, let me uh, jump out again of the presentation and uh, go back to the, we could say the live demo part. So uh, this is the COVID pages that you need at LU. So the, one of the main pages where, where all the information are combined and uh, you can go directly to Ferdom Hub project space from there uh, where you are going to have uh, um, information about people, institutions, and so on and so forth um, of the project. But uh, let me go back here uh, for, a, for a moment, because what we also have here are table of contents of the disease map. So these are all specific diagrams listed here with, uh, with, the, with the source that they are, um, um, they are being stored originally. So Wikipathways, React on Minerva, and so on. And all these diagrams are available um, across this um, basically uh, table. But um, I was mentioning about easy visual content. So um, what I'm showing you here is the Minerva platform. So the, the, the tool for visualizing molecular diagrams that Reinhardt was mentioning before. And uh, let me um, make a, a small uh, advert of the, of the tool. So um, if you are developing your own diagrams, systems biology diagrams, Minerva can handle them. It is not only a tool which is developed specifically for COVID-19 disease map, it's actually content agnostic. So it can, ha uh, it, it can handle and host um, via the web, all sorts of diagrams which you might be creating locally. And if you would be interested in having uh, a Minerva instance for your project, uh, Luxembourg is, LCSB is a part of the European network Elixir. And in, um, within, the, the, within this network, we offer hosting of uh, your diagrams on Minerva, basically free of charge, given that your diagrams, your projects, your maps are open access. So uh, because COVID-19 disease map is open access and we really try to be transparent and so on, it was very easy and straightforward to set up a Minerva instance on Elixir Luxembourg, as you see by the, um, uh, by the, by the URL here. And uh, this is supported precisely by that. And uh, uh, this is an overview diagram of the, of the, you could say a more graphical uh, representation of different pathways uh, of COVID-19. But um, this is one of the diagrams. And uh, if you click on it, you actually have a, a summary information about how this vir virus replication uh, cycle looks like in, as an independent diagram. And this is a diagram which uh, was curated by Marcio. Um, I don't know if Marcio is with us now, but uh, a big shout out for, for his uh, hard work as a, as a bio curator. And, uh, uh, Minerva uh, basically gives access to annotated content of these elements. You can click on an interaction and see what papers have been used and also what species of, um, of SARS-CoV uh, is being considered here. Because very often we rely on the literature, which is not SARS-CoV-2 specific. And in this case, we can just click on the taxonomy and this is indeed SARS-CoV-2 uh, for this particular interaction represented here. So uh, this, these, this is an independent diagram which has been created by Marcio, but a virus replication cycle has also been created in Wikipathways, where it looks uh, as follows. And it's also available in Reactome. So uh, Reactome has two, actually two different uh, pathways, first got SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. And from here, basically, you can jump in directly to Reactome and open it uh, in uh, their native environment. So uh, this is basically uh, the platform uh, that, uh, that allows us to have access and uh, Minerva allows you to search for elements. So for instance, if I will be looking for ACE2, one of the uh, very uh, obvious targets for, um, um, for, um, for SARS-CoV, you are going to see that ACE2 is a target found in virus replication cycle, 
coagulation pathway and endoplasmatic reticulum stress. So if we are going to go to ER, you're going to be directed to where AC2 is being um, curated. And uh, this is one of the interesting and challenging parts of the, um, of the, you could say, parallel curation. Somebody curated again a part of the virus replication cycle where spike protein binds AC and uh, mediates viral entry. So combining this information is not entirely straightforward. But still, all these diagrams are uh, available and they are uh, browsable and you have access to all this content via a programmatic API, uh, which um, automatically or basically which, which makes it easy to, uh, to make use of them and makes, it gives an easy access to, um, to domain experts to take a look and see if the knowledge represented here makes sense or uh, needs to be corrected. So uh, this is the Mineva interface for this, uh, for browsing of the content. I'll be back here for a moment, uh, in, in a moment's time when we're speaking about visualizing omics data, but for the time being, let's jump back to the presentation. So we have uh, integration of externals. Um, so we have three visualization interfaces combined together in a map. And uh, on top of that, we would like to put uh, interaction databases and text mining. So the thing is that if you are going to take a look at formats provided by these tools, uh, is that these formats are not very compatible. And one of the challenges is bringing them together. Uh, one could say one of the challenges would be putting them to work uh, on the map in the first place. Uh, but please remember that actually the people who develop these tools are in our consortium, so in our community. So for us, it was very easy and was a, a fantastic experience to have, uh, for instance, uh, uh, directly people working on, on Omnipath, like, uh, like Tamas Kochmaros or uh, Desho Modos, uh, who are basically uh, developing this together with Julio Sáenz Rodriguez. And uh, they could help us saying, okay, you need to do this like this in order to have access to the uh, interactions. Or uh, for injure text mining tool, um, we had uh, help directly from Ben Giori and uh, John Bachman from, from Harvard. And for BioKB, this is our own internal uh, text mining service. So we immediately were able to access people uh, developing this. So this was very, very, very helpful. So uh, how it worked was that we went across the diagrams that we have. Uh, these are actually diagram groups uh, that we have in the map. We took, uh, these are the elements which are without the frame. We took elements which par participate in these diagrams. Some of them are actually crosstalks, like here you see that my D88 participates in many different maps. And we asked text mining interaction databases, what are, the what are the other molecules targeting this, which are not yet in the map? And you see just from this simple exercise, uh, um, the, the elements in the solid frames are the ones which have been proposed by external information sources as plausible targets uh, to the molecules which are already in the map. So uh, we have tested a couple of these hypotheses, basically took the molecule, uh, took the knowledge which was provided by text mining and evaluated it. And uh, I have to admit that we got a really, really, really nice callback. Of course, uh, that type of computational analysis is going to yield you some, um, some noise. But a lot of this uh, feedback that we were taking a look at the candidate molecules was um, very good quality. So something that a curator can immediately take a look at uh, before starting another PubMed query, before starting to dig through preprints and so on. So that was a very helpful, um, you could say, uh, process or workflow to, uh, to build up the contents of the map. And, uh, so coming back to the integration of external sources, uh, we wanted to give access to structured annotated content in bioinformatic databases. Uh, we got programmatic access to a number of these resources, a lot uh, with, with a lot of help of people actually developing them. And, uh, but unfortunately, still there are some challenges uh, like no unified format or workflow for resources because of different formats that they have. Um, very often these tools use different identifier schemes. So coming up with a reasonable mapping between them is really challenging thing to do. 
and a visualization of these results for curators is quite difficult. The diagram I was showing to you before looked very nice, but it required some work to prepare it in a figure-like view. But uh, giving an access to a tool to a curator that somebody could very quickly browse through these candidates, this is also not a very straightforward thing to do and something we are still fighting with. So uh, for the analysis and modeling, uh, it was uh, very nice to see that already in the early uh, days or, uh, of, of the COVID-19 disease map, people started to work with the content and uh, um, already a couple of months after we started to release some of the diagrams, they were used in uh, different types of analysis. So um, it was an interactome analysis uh, and analysis of signaling pathways. So interactome analysis was based on pure a network uh, analysis with random walks, analysis of signaling pathways was with a tool called Hypathia. Uh, we uh, participated in the uh, hackathon where um, Boolean modeling was used to prioritize drugs for reproposing for COVID-19 disease map. And uh, some early uh, work was also done in uh, kinetic modeling for flux balance analysis for uh, mm, some particular aspects of meta metabolism in alveolar macrophage. Uh, I wouldn't like to go to details into this. Uh, what I wanted to show you is that um, we had that type of activity very early in the process. It was very helpful to spot all sorts of problems in the contents that we were building, but also it helped us very much to frame the goals of the entire project, like why we are gathering all of this, what would be the analytical endpoint? So the thing is that uh, we want, the diagrams are in essence to provide, on one of the endpoints is provide input for analytical and modeling workflows. So in this big diagram that I was mentioning, this would be the endpoint where we take the integrated diagrams, so Wikipathways React on GitLab content, and we can feed it to all sorts of uh, analytical downstream endpoints. So um, for the progress, uh, we actually have API endpoints for a range of workflows across formats uh, because Wikipathways have an API endpoint, React Home has an API endpoint, and the Minerva platform for the independent diagrams also offers one. So this can be used for, uh, for a range of workflows, reproducible workflows, I have to admit, I have to, uh, I have to point out. And uh, we already have some first analytical results uh, discussed with curators and domain experts. And uh, this also helped with diagram development. So, um, but of course we, um, at this level, we also face some challenges, uh, mostly agreeing on diagram granularity and uh, in the analysis so far, we use mostly simplified formats. Um, so, the, ana the ana uh, analysts are still to benefit from the, the real richness of the systems biology representations that we have. And uh, the problem is actually also integration of models and modeling results. Combining Boolean modeling and kinetic modeling is not a straightforward thing to do. But even if, if you rec recall before, we had uh, granularity dif differences or differences in scale between different diagrams. So even if you use the same tool to model two different diagrams, it's very difficult to put uh, two results together because they might be representing events on a different temporal scale. Then uh, having results and reasoning about them is also a very challenging thing to do. But I would like to recap on the entire process coming uh, more closer to an end of uh, my talk today. So. Our aim with the COVID-19 disease map is to build a computational systems biology repository of COVID-19 mechanisms. It's a bit of a mouthful, but the thing is that we would like to focus on the computable uh, repository of COVID-19 mechanisms, but also something which is um, visually explorable. So uh, coming back, the main goals and the main areas of activities is to simultaneously develop these diagrams in the way that they are harmonized, at least to the extent, to maximum extent possible. Uh, we would like to immediately give access to all this content as much as possible, such that uh, our analysts, but also everyone else, the research community can immediately benefit from it. Uh, 
if you recall, the, the, the entire goal of the process was to support COVID research. So if we are going to build some diagrams and then we are going to lock them up, it doesn't make sense. And uh, we wanted to, uh, by engaging analysts by informaticians, we provided them with the input for analytical and modeling workflows, but also we were able to, to assess how good our diagrams are, are, are for that purpose. And uh, what I really wanted to uh, also mention is that uh, I'm presenting the outcomes of um, a work or contributions of over 200 people. So what I really would like to emphasize here at this level is that there were some key ingredients to this setup which made it community effort. And uh, two things that I would like to emphasize the most was um, we really uh, were transparent about uh, our goals and contributions. We had transparent communications about everything. Very early set up uh, a mailing list, Slack channel, uh, everyone was admitted. Uh, whoever wanted to do anything was immediately admitted to all the groups and so on. Regular weekly TCs uh, for a year and a half. Right now we are actually uh, changing the schedule, but for a year and a half, we went uh, two TCs in, in a day in order to accommodate people for, I think, we had people from 11 time zones. So uh, in order to everyone to be able to participate, um, uh, the core team was, on, was there for both TCs and people joined uh, in, according to their time zone, whatever was more convenient. And uh, the second key compartment uh, or se second key component of this effort was that we focused on data and analysis standards. So we wanted to have everything opened again, everything went to GitLab. Uh, we early focused on uh, which systems biology and not only standards we would like to have for different content. And this allowed us to uh, actually um, put all of this together. So I hope this, this picture right now is a little bit more understandable to you and a little bit less scary. Uh, I still find it very impressive. And uh, it's only impressive because uh, each of these elements is an effort of a, of a group, of an individual, contributing their knowledge about something. And this allowed us to make this fantastic, um, you could say, uh, combination or a puzzle uh, mm, combined of all these pieces, uh, which is um, actually a COVID-19 disease map project. So it's not only a map. I would say it's more the community which developed the map and continues to develop it. So to summarize, um, the project is a community-driven effort. Uh, let me emphasize this one again, to encode and investigate mechanisms of COVID-19. Uh, we are bringing together really different uh, diverse groups of, of, uh, of users. And we would like to build transparent and reproducible systems biomedicine content, both diagrams and workflows. And um, you can, uh, let me repeat this, let, you can go to uh, our COVID page um, and uh, to Fathom Hub to see all the contributors. And um, basically, um, this wouldn't happen without over 200, 250 people participating in the DCMF community. This was a really um, impressive and a heartwarming uh, experience to see how many people were able to go an extra mile and to give extra, to, to, to offer something from their knowledge to advance COVID-19 research. Uh, I really would like to thank Ferdom Hub team. Very, very early they came to us and said, okay, we are going to support you with Ferdom Hub. Uh, if you are going to put your project in the Ferdom Hub, what you are going to need. And we really had a couple of sit downs like these and these and these are the features that we would require to make things better. And they sat down and implemented them. That was uh, really, really impressive. Um, uh, in our own, you could say, uh, at the University of Luxembourg, I really would like to uh, thank uh, the rep responsible and reproducible research team at the University of Luxembourg. Very early, we were we needed a lot of communications and data infrastructure, and these guys just opened their suitcases and said, "This is what we have. Take all of it. We are going to help help you to set it up." So uh, all the all the VMs, Slack accounts, GitLab. Uh, websites, resources, all of this was, was very quickly set up and, uh, and is being continuously supported. And uh, Elixir is a European network 
of which nodes, a uh, number of nodes are supporting very actively the project. Um, and um, here I would like to thank you for your attention. I would be happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Parik. Um, there are a lot of things you, you didn't show on the functionality, I think. So everybody who is interested in really the, the functionality of the map should uh, have a look. Uh, you can search for, for chemicals, for publications, for whatever. Uh, you can show protein structures. <laughs> you can show so protein structures, yeah, everything is in there. So it's a lot. Yeah, if you'd like to open the the tool and show some details. Mm -hmm. Like some aspects of the COVID that are more deep in the map. Yeah, so uh, this is what uh, what Reinhardt was mentioning. It's, uh, you know, if, uh, if you open the virus replication cycle, you can, um, you know, you, you can you can see the, the exact details of, of, of the things, but uh, something that uh, indeed uh, uh, is possible to do is to, for instance, uh, immediately visualize a protein structure. This is AC2 mm -hmm. structure. Mm -hmm. So you can you can work, you, you can see, I, I guess, this is where is the transmembrane uh, part of the AC2. This is a receptor, so you can clearly see it. And the tool, this is Molar being developed by one of our colleagues, David Hoxha. And uh, he integrated it very nicely with Minerva. So you can, you can have this. Ah, yes, and I forgot to mention about the analysis part um, is that uh, um, you can show uh, omics data uh, positioned on top of the map. So for instance, these are the cell specific data sets. And for instance, these are for different types of airway secretory cells. And uh, um, if you see, for instance, uh, if we are visualizing them simultaneously, we see that only the type three secretory cells have some uh, differential expression in the virus replication cycle. If I will go there, I will actually find out that only in these uh, in this respiratory uh, parts, I'm going to have TMP RSS2, which is uh, one of the cofactors of uh, viral entry. So that would mean that viral entry might be primarily mediated by airway secretory cells three. And uh, coming back to the overview, you can also take a look uh, how these uh, are being expressed. So uh, you see that uh, uh, kinurenin and synthesis pathway is also one which is rich for these particular cell type. And there are pathways which are uh, equally populated by, um, or similarly populated by, um, by different cell types. So, uh, uh, Minerva gives you uh, gives you this, and as 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 Reinhard was mentioning, you have um, a lot of other functionalities. Like uh, you can also search for, uh, let's say, drug targets. Um, aspirin is uh, one of our uh, our um, our typical targets. Okay, that's that's the drug. Uh, yeah. So so basically, this query shows you in which diagrams we have targets of aspirin. Um, if we would like to add, we can. I think dexamethasone. So we can also check the targets of dexamethasone. Um, I wonder if it's going to be pulled out quickly. Okay, so targets of dexamethasone are not found. So um, this is something, this is automatically being pulled from Campbell and Drag Bank. So probably uh, these are not yet updated. Oh, well, I have to, I most likely typed out uh, drug in the wrong way because it's not mentioned here. Um, is uh, chloroquine oh, being found? Mm. Let's try to find chloroquine. Okay, so we have chloroquine and we have targets of chloroquine like Tolerac receptor 9 and so on. So uh, you can basically uh, look for, let's, if we are going to open the interferon pathway, we are going to see the targets of um, of one drug and the other drug they have slightly different. You are uh, still color. you are still into Minerva, right? Although yes. this representation reminds me of Reacton. 
a little bit? Well, uh, React also intrinsically follows systems biology, uh, graphical notation, uh -huh. uh, um, a process but, description format. Yeah. But actually, they they work so much with complexes, right? Everything is a complex there. As a matter of fact, yes. Uh, diagrams represented in Minerva also can show that. But what we do is we try to show contents of the complex. So uh, uh, I remember that in, in React Home, you need to expand it. And here, basically, uh, things are, are, are shown like that. Um, they have those double dots. Yes, both both approaches have their own uh, advantages. Like React Home complexes can be more compact, but when you visualize data, uh, you are not going to be able to show them inside of the complex. So oh, this no. is going. So this is something. Uh, I like it. I like it. I like it your way, <laughs> the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what you hear in the background are my children having. Uh, no, no problem. Sorry for that. Okay. Marek, there's a question in the chat. Yes, just a second. I'm just checking. So, uh, uh, of a discovery made possible due to the, uh, um, yeah, uh, due to these uh, maps. Um, yeah, so um, I don't recall correctly at this moment. So, uh, there is a second paper. Uh, in, we have a paper in preparation which summarizes all the findings uh that uh that was uh, that were taken but if i recall correctly um there was some boolean model analysis which uh shown one of the interferon one pathway um targets as particularly sensitive um target for for drug perturbation for downstream uh for downstream COVID response so uh this would be one of them um, to be honest, I, I'm particularly not very deep into analytical results and uh, uh, people are right now combining them together into, mm -hmm. into a paper. I am not in charge of that, but uh, there, there, are, there are already uh, some, some um, initial, initial findings in this. So um, I'm very sorry. This was a good question because I don't have a good answer for it. Um, mm -hmm. Still, uh, this is the this is the reason to be for the project. So we pay attention to that. that it should be helpful. It should uh, allow uh, that type of analysis and uh, and some positioning of drug targets. But one thing that the Reactome allows people to do is to upload a RNA seq experiment and see how the gene expressions are mm -hmm. shown in the map. You only yeah. have uh, pre-computed uh, gene expression experiments, or can can I upload mine? Uh, yes, the, you can upload your own uh, your own experiments. Uh, the format is is relatively straightforward. Uh, all you need is to have a, a a user account on the map, because these are publicly available data sets. If you are going to log in with your account, you're going to be able to upload your data sets and they are not going to be visible to anyone else. So um, Minerva allows you to do that, yes. Now, this is uh, corresponding to the question of uh, doing some discovery, right? Sometimes you put yes. your data there and see how the genes are reacting, yeah. Indeed. Um, this also allowed us to actually, uh, there was a, 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 a question about the cell specificity of, of the mechanisms in, in, in these diagrams. And uh, this is one of the answers that um, to that question is that you can take a diagram which describes um, general mechanisms of, uh, of viral uh, infection and then you can project cell specific data on top and see which molecules are actually active and uh, then you can derive the the signaling pathways or, or basically the roots in these uh, diagrams which are specific for different cells uh, or at least you can reason about that i'm i'm seeing uh yes gabriel wants to ask something yeah i'm here uh, so, uh, Marek, I, I, I have one question about the about the data and also the, the the curator's work because during this pandemic we we had a, a hush for for knowledge generation about COVID nineteen and uh, we know that instead of the creation of 
a lot of knowledge. We created a, a lot of data and often we see some kind of a, a spurious interpretation of this data. So how do the curators deal with these thousands of papers and the possibility of spurious information? Uh, that's a, a very, uh, that's a very good question. Well, uh, if, on a couple of levels. So first of all, as I was mentioning, we had uh, a, a lot of discussions uh, on, on the forum uh, to see, okay, does this make sense? Does, does this make sense? Um, we had uh, cross checks uh, in between, um, like uh, React Home curators take, uh, took a look at our diagrams and uh, uh, I remember that Marcia, Alexander, other people were taking a look at React Home diagrams. So uh, basically to have uh, that type of external view of what's in there. And uh, last but not least, we used text mining to cut through these uh, interactions um, because uh, to cut through these, uh, these literature papers. Uh, because even if you have these interactions, they contain noise, you can still filter them out uh, by quality, by belief, and so on. And, uh, and then when you, when you position only the top ones, um, you really have a good quality output. So a uh, couple of things like that. Uh, so first of all, by, um, you could say, interpersonal communication about what's being represented. Uh, second, um, also by taking a look at how many papers discuss the same, um, the same problem. And third, by uh, reaching out to external uh, knowledge sources for confirmation or for ideas. Yes, because I was imagining to, uh, if you could implement something like a voting system. So there was a kind of evidence level to support each direction. So you can be based, it can be based on the number of papers saying that same thing, or maybe one specialist go there into the, 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 the Minerva uh, environment and the kind of flag those problems or the, those uh, interactions that they know that it's real. Well, uh, Minerva allows you to comment uh, directly. You have in the in the right mm -hmm. under the right click, you have the add comment functionality, and you can add oh, it nice. to yeah. to an element or to an interaction. So uh, that type of feedback is always possible. Um, from my experience on a number of um, curation projects, uh, you would be expecting that people are going to be commenting, but usually they don't, unfortunately even if they have the easiest voting system, um, usually it's, uh, it's more uh, consumption oriented uh, behavior. Like people just go in to get what they want to have. And uh, uh, even if they see there's something wrong, they say, ah, okay, the resource is wrong and I'm not going to use it. Or uh, this interaction is wrong. I'm not going to contact anyone. So uh, having that type of uh, spontaneous feedback from the community is very difficult to, uh, uh, to get uh, what's more useful is actually grabbing people by the wrist and dragging <laughs> them to resources and saying, look at this diagram, do you think it's okay? And then you're going to say, ah, I think these interactions are not entirely good. Okay, which ones? Okay, then I'm going back and I'm correcting it. So- uh, yeah, Which is the this, curator's work, yeah. This is the curator's work. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, yeah, there are, there are systems uh, where, where you can vote and uh, even, even the text mining, Indra has a, has a voting system there, a uh, quite useful one. But uh, again, I think that uh, when you're kind of a more oriented on checking out what the pathway is, you might have um, less motivation to comment on it. So um, uh, in our case, we were good because we had all these parallel efforts so everyone was interested in the old diagram and they were perfecting it and building them and expanding them. So it required a little bit of just quality cross-check across them to say, okay, these things should be corrected. And you had immediately the person to correct that. But to have external feedback, um, well, we'll have to see when our uh, MSB paper is going to be out, perhaps more people will be willing to comment. Yeah, you know, because uh, especially here in Brazil, that there are some people that are uh, like defenders of some some medication, so they they defend yeah. 
the medication, even they don't, they don't know uh, what the medication is. So probably they are going to see this presentation and they are going to Minerva and they, they will type for chloroquine and they will say, yeah. so, so there is a work from the University of Luxembourg that designed a map and it proves that chloroquine works. <laughs> I I I, yeah. I I believe that this is a way more complex problem yeah, yeah, than, yeah, I than know, what I you're saying. And the biggest problem is that people already know what they want to know, and uh, they they don't work very well with authorities and uh, especially experts. If you're if you're going to say that experts ah this is a conspiracy or something like that, and, uh, you cannot fight that type of logic with proof. Uh, yeah. it, it requires a different approach, I believe. I'm seeing the, the uh, hand raised by Ellison. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Ellison is a curator in uh, Weak Pathways. Ask your question, Ellison. Do you have a microphone there? Uh, can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Uh, hi, Dr. Murray. Uh, I just like to congratulate you for this hi, amazing hello. lecture. And uh, present for you. I, I'm a weak path creator. I think I mean the only Brazilian creation of the weak path. And uh, it's a pleasure. Once again, congratulations for your lecture. Uh, yeah. Did I see your your picture at the curator of the week once, I think? Oh, nice. <laughs> I think I think you were featured as a curator of the week once, once or twice, I think even. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. Two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm visiting the Wikipassworth website quite regularly as, as we are harmonizing our formats. And uh, yeah, I remember, I, I, I think I, I saw your picture there. So uh, yeah, um, Wikipassworth is, an, is a, one of the key critical parts of, 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 the, of the entire map project. So, and, and this was also, again, important for the community effort. We had a number of, uh, we had both two big pathway uh, groups and our independent curators. And uh, saying that one takes over the other is going to is, is not good for the chemistry of the of the community. So um, basically, uh, all all the contributions are are very valuable. And, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Likewise. Yeah. See, we 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 used to to ask our students here to start drawing the diagrams uh, in path visual. So okay. do, you, do, do you think that cell design would be the way to go to start designing there or to design straight in Minerva? What do you think? Um, uh, Minerva is not made for diagram design. Uh, Minerva is made to show diagrams which have been drawn in uh, in another diagram editor. Okay. So in this case, uh, and uh, Minerva should be able to handle both Path Visio and uh, Cell Designer uh, content. Uh, what we are more used to is uh, to draw Cell Designer, uh, to draw in Cell Designer, but um, perhaps just check one tool and the other one and then make up your mind. Uh, um, it should no, be, okay. Uh, we we are used to 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 doing uh, 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 PF but uh, I was uh, asking if there is some advantages of cell design. Um, pretty much, pretty mm -hmm. much, they get to the same point, right? Yeah, uh, there are differences between them. Uh, Path Visio allows to draw a little bit more, you could say, relaxed diagrams. So more close to a, 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 a graphical editor, uh, it makes it uh, easier to to, to draw um, a concept that you have. It makes mm -hmm. it slightly, but it makes it challenging downstream, because okay. uh, because you don't have a data model underneath and the diagram is not constrained. So uh, there might be some uh, mistakes. And uh, in, for instance, if you're drawing in Cell Designer. Uh, you cannot uh, draw like a freehand line in there. You uh -huh. always need to connect all your elements and uh, and so on and so forth. So this is controlled. So good, uh, good to hear that. <laughs> it, 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 it really depends. It really depends uh, what what you want and what your project is all about. And um, yeah, I encourage you to, to try. Uh -huh. Cell designer and, and compare with Padvisio and whatever suits you more. Uh, no, well, use it. okay. But you know, uh, do you do you recommend to follow the straight lines of uh, uh, 
systems biology markup language to be compatible with your presentation later? Uh, I am you don't not have trying... a markup language there. How, how you represent phosphorylation, how you represent inhibition, how you represent... Ah, yeah. You, you, you have a file like that in Minerva now. You... Yeah, so um, because uh, this is a very good question, a very good point. Uh, this information uh, has to be translated acro um, uh, across the... Um, uh, because uh, this is uh, uh, the, the information which is being differently represented across the formats, uh, it very often is lost. Um, uh, when we, uh, when uh, cell designer has a pretty decent way of representing all of this, and we handle all this information, mm -hmm. um, I remember that some of the phosphorylation uh, sites. The way uh, they are represented in GPML, so in Path Physio, they can be translated to, to Cell Designer and back. So this information will not be entirely lost. Um, still, uh, post-translational modifications, complex formations, and so on, these are uh, information which are differently represented. Because uh, what, what I can tell you is that uh, SBML is a markup language that was in turn initially planned for modeling. Okay. SBGN is a, a format which was initially meant for a graphical representation of diagrams, like a style sheet. And uh, both formats evolved towards the, to complement the others. So uh, instead of having a harmonization, you have a, a two parallel developments on SBML side and SBGN side. And uh, the way they are representing things is not entirely uh, parallel. Because in SBML, you represent this on the modeling side and the graphics comes later. In SBGN, you are wondering how you are going to draw it and then how you're going to model it. So uh, there are some discrepancies in between them. Um, so if, we your curator, to... if your curator from Brazil wants to collaborate and contribute, it would have to have some meetings with your people and uh, to, to study your pathways and your diagrams to see how, how to do this, right? We are very. We would be very happy to to provide any guidance that you might need, and uh, I, I think it would be pretty straightforward to figure out what kind of processes you are going to represent, and mm -hmm. what kind of editor would be the most suitable for that. And if we agree on that, uh, then, like I said, we handle multiple formats, so it shouldn't be a problem mm -hmm. in the end. We are currently working with schizophrenia. Are you interested in to have this? Yes. Um, Let's do it. <laughs> we are we, we are constructing a diagram. Okay, I would be would be happy to help there. All set. Some some people are, are asking if they can upload the G GWAS, uh, data. I think that any yeah. table that you can upload, you 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 can uh, kind of mark in the in the maps, right? Yeah. So um, I this? don't know what would Let be the format the of I don't know what would be the format of the associated loci. Uh, the GWAS data, yeah, the GWAS yeah. data we we map uh, by. I the, think, on, I on, think on, Leonardo, are you are you aiming to have a binary input like blue or or yellow or something like that? Because we we saw some data with uh, degrees of uh, red, right, for intensity. Yeah. If you want to open your mic. So you said you have to open an account because you will upload your data on a, on a map that only you can see, right? And uh, maybe uh, Leonardo has to, to, to figure out a way to, to put uh, the information on a table, right? like one or zero and then uh, you will get the 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 proteins labeled like uh, totally red or not red right yeah basically you have like summary statistic uh, information about each of the loci like the uh, ratio uh and mm -hmm. the, the associated p-value 
So yeah, if you can upload the p-values, you would have the the red bar going up and down, right, uh, Merrick? Yes, exactly. If you can normalize this, this can be uh, this can be uploaded. And uh, um, I don't think we have time for that. But uh, Minerva actually allows also to visualize uh, variant level uh, information. So if you have a, a list of particular variants in a gene, uh, this can also be shown and. Uh, I think we also have a format to map them for the coding ones to the protein structure. So uh, if you would have the, the genomic information, this is also uh, possible to be visualized in a diagram. Yeah, that's the case. Usually we have like the variant ID, like the chromosome position and yeah, the gene and, and the p-value and in, in a number that, that translates like the strength of association. Thanks. So, Reinhard, I have some master students that I cannot uh, find some grants to go over there. If you have some kind of support, I'd love to, to have people collaborating with Merrick. <laughs> But we can we can go online like like America. We, we'd love to start with this schizophrenia diagram. But as I told you, I have uh, interest on mammary gland development, retina development, mm -hmm. things like that. You think that you could host those uh, evolutive uh, uh, based pathways sometime? Yeah, hosting the pathways I think shouldn't be a problem. Uh, we just would have to, to train the people uh, to use the tools and then they could go from there. Mm. So it could be also done on a, on, a, on a visit. I mean, three months visit or whatever that they get known to all the tools and they uh, uh -huh. practice a little bit and then they go back and uh, work on, on the maps. That would be possible, I guess. Uh -huh. I would, I would be very interested because I am a contributor of weak pathways, but I'm quite more interested in the uh, presentation that you have in Minerva and et cetera, and if, even because you can open the, the, the subject for contribution of the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. Merrick Mer is on top of, of that. So mm -hmm. we, we have some very complete, like Ebola. Ellison uh, uh, built a, a diagram for Ebola infection. It, it's great, so, uh, but we cannot fit that in any famous uh, place. So if you are available for the Ebola infection, maybe we have one that's ready to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, let's explore this Complete, first. Yeah. yeah, it's not in the format like react on, like, mm -hmm. like reaction by reaction. We, we had a strong influence of keg in the beginning, you know. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, uh, keg will be a way of that, right? So you, you don't have a parallel or input or, or connection or whatever. Mark, you want to answer this? Uh, well, the, the, the whole, basically the, the whole purpose of the disease maps is actually to allow people to host diagrams which are not in the pathway databases. Mm -hmm. So no, we, we do not replicate any efforts of CAG. I, I think that these pathways are very, very valuable. Uh, but uh, the, the core of our effort is that there are the, the pathway databases which focus on canonical mechanisms and uh, there are a lot of people who have, like, like you Miguel mentioned, independent efforts on, on this disease, that disease, that process, the other process, and they don't entirely fish, uh, fit the canonical pathway uh, description sometimes. Uh, they, uh, yeah. Sometimes you just need to set it up, uh, collaborate quickly with the community, map some data on top, make it uh, visible and persistent. Uh, accessible online. So this is more or less uh, our line of work. Yeah, and um, they are charging for access, right? So it's, uh, it's another word. Right now, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But they do not represent like that when, when they have inhibition, they do, the phosphorylation, they do not represent the protein before phosphorylation and after phosphorylation. So they just put a phosphate there. So it's not uh, interchangeable formats. Yeah. 
But also, also, uh, how is the copyright in this business? Like, uh, I see a pathway there. I I put in my platform. You know, uh, of course, people give authorship, right? So you mentioned I based my my biogram yes. on uh, yes. mixing keg and yes. and with yes. pathway from. Yes, some some people what, might uh, might cite keg as part of the diagram, maybe even someday. Indeed, when you are drawing a diagram, uh, you can have uh, a provenance for an, a, a reaction, saying, "Okay, this comes from this keg pathway, and this comes from this wiki pathway pathway." Uh -huh. The whole logic being, I don't think there is a point in redrawing any access of available pathways in keg on no, the on wiki pathways. Put it in Minerva. This, doesn't make much sense. Uh, you are always going to be creating like your own version of it. As long sure. as there is an attribution of where does it come from, I think it should be okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, but sometimes you increase the pathway. With Adriano, we are developing a text mining tool and we double the, the, the amount of proteins. We, we pick a, a keg pathway just for to show an example and we double the number of proteins in the in in this in the existing pathway mm -hmm. just to, to to show the power of the text mining tool so i love the, the text mining tool. i love everything so <laughs> i'd like to be in touch maybe uh i'm trying to do an effort to 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 teach some students to do pretty much a, a draw a drawing of uh, of this, but usually because I pick the genes and uh, I ask for the taxonomy taxonomic distribution, and with this I I try to figure out if the gene is old or new, right? So uh, uh, for Reacton we have a solution where we upload a table with zeros and ones, and when we we hit the play we have the the pathway originating you know sometimes i can show you maybe maybe i can send to you a result like that for you to 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 maybe to get inspired it's very interesting you can pick a a a, a pathway there and you can see a, a what re, which reactions uh, exist since the prokaryotes which ones in mammals, which one is only in hominidios, uh, hominoids, you know? Mm -hmm. It's an interesting approach. We, we, we applied that for reactom, but reactom is too much biochemistry, I think. I wanted to, to study some pathways like uh, menstruation, schizophrenia, things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want, I want to show, I'll send you a... a, a okay, yeah, send us a few, few pointers and yeah. more papers, and then we have a look, and then yeah. uh, maybe we should follow up and then see what we can... Uh, see, the Ebola, the Ebola pathway, for instance, by Ellison. Mm -hmm. would be nice. Yeah. Ebola is, a, is kind of a disease, too. <laughs> yeah. we, we can go on, right? Okay, yeah. When, sure. when Ellison started the master... Uh, work, I sent a, a protein that I thought it was important for HIV infection. And he started the, the, the study and said, well, Miguel, uh, Ebola, I love this virus. <laughs> I sent the wrong receptor and uh, so that he moved to study Ebola <laughs> instead of HIV. <laughs> do, do you have HIV there, Mark? Uh, no, we, we haven't we haven't uh, have had a map, but uh, I remember Venkata was uh, very much uh, engaged in a in a pro mm -hmm. project on text mining for for HIV mutations. Yeah, uh, but not not the di not the diagram not the diagram like you did for COVID. I'm very interested to contribute with HIV if you'd like because of the 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 exchange of um, cell that it, it does it, it starts uh, focusing on one cell and when it, it destroys your immunity then it focuses on another cell and then kills you i would love to i love to 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 put that on a diagram that is difficult that's, that's the, 
Yeah, we okay. did a lot of text party. <laughs> So, Reinhard, it was great having you guys here. Oh, thank you. What did you think? It was, was, thank you very was much. good. Yeah. That, okay. was, that was great. Thank you very much. It was great, Merrick. Great knowing you. Okay. Likewise. Yeah. And I hope so, we see each other somewhere soon on a, on a real soon. conference. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Have a nice day and thanks Plenty for having me. Nice so thanks a lot. Thank you yes. very, very much. Thank you. Have Thank a nice you day. All. Bye bye. Bye.